And so if you have your Bibles, please open up with me a familiar to us place of scripture that contains the unsearchable riches of Christ, the unsearchable wisdom and the depths of the knowledge and wisdom of God that the Holy Spirit, the greater and deeper, reveals before us. The book of Matthew 5:45 and 48, that you may be sons of your Father in heaven, for he makes the sun rise on the evil and on the good. When it says that you may be, this is a command, and this is the same words that God used to create the visible creation. For he makes the sun rise on the evil and on the good, and sends rain on the just and on the unjust. Therefore you shall be perfect, just as your Father in heaven is perfect. And so this verb is given or taken, say, from the military lexicon, and it is in the format again of a command. The sermon that I would like to continue is called Called to Perfection. This promise contained in the commandment is the inheritance of the saints of all generations, and this commandment of Christ is addressed specifically to his students. Therefore, people who do not accept God's delegated authority over themselves have no part in the inheritance <coughs> that is contained in this commandment and are not able to have it. These people cannot be the students of Christ. Relevant to fulfilling this required commandment, we stop to study the purpose of the righteousness of God in the heart of a man, specifically the goals that the righteousness of God abiding within our heart is called to pursue. This again, this righteousness should be the atmosphere of the heart of a man. We've also been studying in part the purpose of the righteousness of God within our heart received by us in the two broken tablets in which we die by the law for the law to live for the one that died and resurrected and by doing so receive confirmation of our salvation in the new tablets of the covenant in the format of the law of the spirit of life so that he would provide, we would provide God a basis to give us the promise to be heirs of peace not by the past law, but by the righteousness of faith, like he gave it to Abraham and his seed. And again, this was independent from the law and not in the law. For the promise that he would be the heir of the world was not to Abraham or to his seed through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. Romans 4.13 we note that the righteousness of faith is determined by the obedience of our faith to the faith of God, which is presented in the preached word of God sent, together with the person who represents the fatherhood of God for us. Our faith is obedience to God's faith. God's faith is the word of God that comes out of the mouth of his delegated ones. The scriptures say faith is from hearing the word of God. And so faith is not emotions or feelings. This is information. And it's not important what our feelings may be experiencing. If we will be led by our feelings and trying to determine whether God is with us or has abandoned us based on our feelings, we will never become perfect. We are called perfect immediately after we begin to behave in accordance to the information that we hear that comes out out of the mouth of God by his delegated ones and if the scripture say say this and consider yourself this way and call yourself this way although you may not be this way currently the scripture say in my heart God says you are this way and in my goals you are this way so call yourself that way and when we agree to this we immediately become perfect because perfection is not in our works but in obedience of our faith to God's faith. 
And so the promise of the peace of God is given only to those men that are obedient, that have clothed themselves into the virtue of students, that gave them the, the ability to be obedient to the order of God in accordance to which God sends us his words by the mouth of his delegated ones, not by our own personal intellect. When we say with, with uh, a pride, oh, I have my own mind, I have my own Bible, many preachers, this is their uh, titled phrase where they say, this is my Bible, this is what my Bible says, as if this is his work, as if he is the one who wrote it, this is my Bible, not understanding what he's saying how these words affect God and how God sees the and looks at this preacher, this Bible, the Bible is God's book. These are God's thoughts that re are revealed only to those that are humble and with a contrite spirit and that tremble before his word. Therefore, the covenant of peace within the heart of man is the result of the obedience of his faith, his faith to the faith of God, which are the spoken words of God's delegated ones. In a specific format, we've already looked at six signs by which we need to determine and examine ourselves as to whether we are the sons of peace as well as the sons of God and have been studying the seventh sign. This is our ability to be clothed into the essence or clothe our essence into the holy and selective love of God. This is how I call it in the sermon because many saints don't understand what holy love means. Holy is selective. This means that God loves one and hates the other and that he does not behave toward everyone the same and he doesn't love us just as we are. He loves us as he sees us to be and not as we feel we are or how he but how he sees us in Jesus Christ. He loves the righteous and hates the sinner means those sinners that say we are by nature this way we can't do it any differently God knows and sees our weaknesses and they see that I am of sin and so he is compassionate toward me when I sin he isn't compassionate if you are sinning and you condemn yourself and repent then he's compassionate but if he if you want him to be compassionate towards you when you don't want to battle with those sins or against them he will not be compassionate toward you but above all these things put on love which is the bond of perfection and let the peace of God rule in your hearts we could see here that the peace of God can only rule within our hearts when the love of God agape is existing when we're clothed into this love of God <clears throat> and let the peace of God rule in your hearts to which you also are called in one body and be thankful Colossians 3 14 15 in one body means that this can happen only when we are an organic member of the body of Christ we are part of the order of God. Let's look at the body of Christ and an individual body of a person. These are as one. How does your body work in harmony? <clears throat> All of the inner organs work in surprising harmony. And they have... And they, uh, and they have no issues with the mind controlling the body. This is as God's theocracy works, one head. But people don't want to agree with that, that one pastor be the head. Yes, there needs to be one pastor as the head. And even if they agree with that, they want to make sure that he is voted for by the majority vote and that they have the ability to control this pastor, tend this pastor, and tell him what he can say and what he cannot say. This is no longer the body of Christ. This is uh, a some kind of other 
essence with many heads. We have noted that according to this place of scripture, the reign of the peace of God within our heart is possible only upon one condition, and that is if the selective love of God will abide within our heart, and if we will be clothed into the selective love of God. We have noted in the selective love of God, which is the atmosphere of the peace of God, we see concealed the good, wonderful, eternal, and uncomprehending for the human mind, goals, and works of God, called to build a unique and peaceful relationship between God and exclusively with his children, with his students. In Scripture, the character of the selective love of God is presented by the Holy Spirit in Scripture, by the preached word of the apostles and prophets, in the form of seven unchanging virtues. Virtue, knowledge, self-control, perseverance, godliness, brotherly kindness, and love. These are written in 2 Peter 1, 2 through 8. We conclude that each of the seven qualities of the fruit of virtue, and these are fruit, are in one the other and contain the characteristics of all the other qualities, which is why they flow one from the other, complete one the other, strengthen one the other, and confirm the truthful nature of one the other. Second, these qualities, these seven characteristics, are called to be the moral perfection within our heart and an example that is, that is inherent to the essence of our Heavenly Father. Third, the given qualities are the great and precious promises entrusted to us through Jesus Christ and in Jesus Christ. Fourth, in the given qualities presented in these seven characteristics, we see the imperishable treasure and the unsearchable wealth of Christ with which we need to become rich and that have nothing to do, again, with perishable wealth that are corrupt and will be burned. Fifth, in order to receive the inheritance of these qualities, these seven unchanging characteristics, to be clothed into them is possible if we receive the power of the Holy Spirit as the Lord and Master of our life, which is possible when we leave the position of spiritual childhood or spiritual infancy. As being an infant or a child, spiritually, you cannot, the Holy Spirit cannot be your Lord and Master because they, these infants and children, are attracted by every wind of doctrine and cannot understand the Holy Spirit. Even their thoughts they receive as the thoughts of the Holy Spirit. And so preachers that, that have this kind of uh, spiritual position say, the Holy Spirit has revealed and it was their mind that revealed it. Unfortunately, people like this and there is people like this they communicate with themselves and when you communicate with yourself this is very possible this is not an illness David communicated with himself but he communicated correctly he told his soul why are you dismayed why are you disappointed I will praise the Lord even greater or the more and the emotional aspect of the soul was showing him that uh, he is uh, has no way out that he's in a trap but David would tell him not to be disappointed or dismayed so that, that they will continue to praise God if you remember as Elisha was with his uh, helper on the hill and the, the uh, army surrounded the hill his assistant, his helper was telling Elisha that they had no way out and this is the end of things and and uh, Elisha had compassion on him and asked the Lord to open the eyes of his helper and when God opened his eyes he saw that the entire mountain was filled with God's army we may not have to see it with our physical eyes but we need to know God says I won't leave you I am always with you the angel of the Lord surround or create a defense around his own God's own people we may not feel this we need to know we need to know this we can't rely upon our soul so you need to talk to your soul and tell your soul to rely upon the Lord 
don't base upon base things upon what you feel or see, but what the Lord says. Six, the means that we are to use to receive the power of the Holy Spirit as the Lord and Master of our life is the obedience of our faith to the faith of God. This is the relationship of a, of a warrior of Christ with his captain, with the perfecter of our faith. Seventh, by inheriting these great and precious promises, in the form of the fruit of our spirit, we become a part of God's divine nature, which is why the confessions of the faith of our heart become equal in power to the words that come out of the mouth of God, since the selective love of God demonstrated in the seven unchanging qualities and characteristics have nothing in common with and cannot have anything in common with the nature of human love that is filled with egoism, greed, and is just temporary. You are obligated because you are my husband, you are my wife, you are my children, you are my parents. They don't thank their parents that the parents do something for them. They say, huh, why do I need to thank them? They are my parents. This is their obligation. You see what kind of love this is, even the love of Storgi, this is a, a familial love. I'm not talking about the other forms of love here, but just even this. There's the filial love, which is French, uh, f love of friendship. You're my friend, and, and if they ask, you need to tell them I didn't do it. Or if my wife asks you something, then say that this didn't happen or did happen, because you're required, you're my friend. And so based upon this familial love or friend, uh, love of friendship, or love even between a man and a woman, what does a man do or a woman do? This is greed. But this is, but God's love cannot be treated this way because it's very different. The power of the selective love of God in the format of seven qualities of unearthly virtue is called to enthrone the resurrection of Christ in our earthly bodies. This tolerant behavior toward one another and enthrone the resurrection of Christ in our earthly bodies and clothe our earthly body into the resurrection of Christ that is into our new person. The bond of perfection of the selective love of God is unconditional when it comes to the seven qualities of virtue. It's not unconditional in general, it is unconditional toward those people that have been clothed into these seven qualities. Unlike the tolerant and egotistical love of man, the unconditional nature of the selective love of God in the seven qualities of virtue is different in that it contains the burning jealousy of God, his all knowledge and his absolute wisdom. Human love is blind, however it may be, God's love is not blind and is not able to be used for greedy, egotistical goals or purposes of a man. At the same time, the tolerant love of man toward other men is very conveniently used, as we know, for greedy and egotistical purposes, because they say love is blind. You can even love a goat. And so then they fall in love with goats and suffer for the rest of their li life. God's love agape loves only one that is in its likeness. It doesn't look at the outward characteristics of a man or a woman. <coughs> it looks at the inner characteristics, and if they're not in accordance to its own nature, then it will never fall in love with that person. Because even poets understood that love, true love, it absolutely does not depend on the outer uh, uh, qualities of a person. There's one uh, Georgian poet that wrote uh, a very classical poem, and he was born and uh, grew up at the same time. Uh, time as uh, Pushkin did, who is a, pr a pretty popular poet as well. But they say about him that his, uh, his poems, they were very similar to those of Pushkin. 
are a remind us of the thing he said about of beauty. And so he was writing things as the outer appearance of you is not what is in accordance to what's inside. It's, it, it's sometimes an imperfection that a, a person will love what is not true or true essence of. And so again, looking at the beauty of a person, loving someone truly, or he talks about how loving someone truly or sincerely, the aging of a person will not have any effect or change of that love that you have upon them. And it's a very beautiful thing that he wrote, uh, very, very deep in thought, and actually is very much in accordance to the spirit of Scripture. This love that he describes is not in any way a tolerant love of that is generally existing in men. In Scripture, the love of God is identified with such words. Songs of Solomon 8, 6, 7, Set me as a seal upon your heart, as a seal upon your arm. For love is as strong as death, jealousy as cruel as the grave. Its flames are flames of fire, a most vehement flame. Many waters cannot quench love, nor can the floods drown it. If a man would give for love all the wealth of his house, it would be utterly despised. The measure of the love of God is identified in Scripture by and is known by the measure of God's hatred toward evil and men who do this evil. If we don't know how to hate, we don't know how to love either. And the power and measure of hatred will be equal to the measure and power of hate, uh, of love. You have loved righteousness and hated lawlessness, therefore God, your God, has anointed you with the oil of gladness more than your companions. Hebrews 1, nine. Lawlessness and righteousness are programs that are not abstract or independent from a human being. They can only be demonstrated where, when they're in a programmable system, the heart of a person. The Lord tests the righteous, but the wicked and the one who loves violence his soul hates. Upon the wicked he will rain coals, fire and brimstone, and a burning wind shall be the portion of their cup. For the Lord is righteous, he loves the righteous, his countenance beholds the upright. Psalm 11, 5 through 7. The unclean are people that were previously holy that were previously holy and were students, these wicked or unclean, but suddenly then resisted God and said, it's enough for us to be students, we are now teachers, it's enough. And this is the moment when they, that moment when they wanted to be uh, teachers and no longer wanted to be students, they became wicked. Because as soon as a teacher stops being a student and says he's a teacher, then he now wants the role of the teacher, the place where God did not place him, and he begins to dig under the teacher, uh, spread bad information about him so he could take his place. This, These are the wicked or unclean. Only loving what God loves and hating what God hates, we are able to demonstrate God's perfection in his reaction toward the righteous and perform good and the good and the unrighteous who perform lawlessness. The selective love of God by its unchanging nature in the format of seven supernatural qualities is called to grow us into the fullness of growth in Christ or lead us into the perfection that is like the perfection of our Heavenly Father so we can shine the light of our Son upon the just and the unjust and pour out our reins according to God's intentions upon the righteous for good and the unrighteous to punish them. Considering their 
therefore, that these seven qualities of virtue identifying the selective love of God do not have an analog of the, in the earthly realm of the human lexicon, not in any dictionary of the world that is accessible to man. The love of God is the foundation and atmosphere of the moral and immovable law opening within our heart, the essence of God and the essence of the heavenly kingdom. And this is not all. The love of God agape is a sovereign love which is unconditional when it comes to the people it chooses in its ability to foreknow and predestine. And based on its ability to foreknow, it then predestines. For whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might the, be the firstborn among many brethren, Romans 8.29. He has foreknown us before the creation of the world. He has this quality to see ahead of time, to foreknow that the devil has no ability the devil what he sees in actual time is what he works from because of its sovereignty the selective love of God never violates the sovereign rights of those people she selects and that is why it knocks. I sta stand at the door and knock. If anyone, anyone opens the door and hears my voice, opens the door, I will come in and dine with him and he with me. People of the flesh from the category of infants will never be able to hear because they don't have uh, the ear of the heart. If they would have this ear of the heart, they would have known the voice of their Lord in the mouth of the one that God has sent. They for themselves become a voice, their own personal intellect or the intellect of another person that is attempting to pervert the truth in order to give them the basis uh, uh, or the justification that they're able to interpret the scriptures and explain them. Our head is necessary to hear what God says and obey it and fulfill what God says and not decide for itself what is correct and what is incorrect. In a specific format, we've already looked at the demonstration of the selective love of God in the qualities of virtue, knowledge, self-control, and perseverance, and stop to study the virtue of the love of God in the mystery of great godliness. And without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifested in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen by angels, preached among the Gentiles, believed on in the world, received up in glory. 1 Timothy 3.16 we will keep in mind that all God has done by His Church. He has done all of this by His Church. So it be made known by the Church to the principalities in heaven the many forms of God's grace. God had made by His people Himself known. He is the true light. He says, You are the light of the world. You will demonstrate Me and My light. And in hell, it is known as well. So when the seven sons of the high priest made the decision to rebuke demons, as Apostle Paul does in the name of Jesus, they began to tell demons in the name of that Jesus that Apostle Paul is preaching about uh, come out and the, that D devils that demon said I know Jesus and Apostle Paul I know but who are you your names are not known in hell for us to be able to obey you demons will obey when your names are known in hell but your names will be known in hell when you resist these demons and leave your nation the house of your father and your corrupt desires and we die then by the death of the Lord Jesus 
for our nation, our house, or the house of our Father, when we'll be separated by the Lord Jesus, the, then our names will become known in heaven, on earth, and in hell. By demonstrating the signs of the fruits of godliness, we identified the true quality of the love of God agape within the heart of a man, in his words, in his actions, and the most important, the manner in which he dresses. That isn't supposed to prompt the instincts of the opposite gender. And as I often say, before uh, demons would chase uh, undressed people in the cemeteries, we see this nakedness in the church today, and you can't tell if it's a church today or not, if a person thinks that they are Christian and uh, uh, open up all their intimate areas, thinking that the nakedness of his body in the church is somehow fitting because it's not fitting to what God calls a church. You see, when Adam and Eve made themselves clothing of fig leaves, they were not able to cover their nakedness before the face of God. They hid themselves from Him. And then God covered their nakedness. They, he them, Himself made them clothes from uh, skins, uh, animal skins. And this, of course, symbolized the, the redemption uh, that we have in Jesus Christ. The fig leaves uh, are when we, the decisions we make thinking that we know what's good and, and what's not good or right or, or what's wrong. Further, we note that there's a fundamental difference between the goodness of God and his favor toward man and the godliness of a man which is called to demonstrate his love, which he is called to demonstrate in his love to God. For example, the godliness of a man is his favor for God, a man's grace for God, and his thanksgiving. The godliness of a man is the ability of a man to visit the fatherless and the widow in their hardship and keep themselves from being defiled by the world. The godliness of a man is imitating Christ and meditating about the things of the hill, seek God in his good, acceptable, and perfect will. The godliness of God is the reaction of God uh, to the favor a man shows him. This is his goodness. Uh, this is God's goodness toward man because man seeks the light and seeks God himself, not trying to hide from God or pervert his commandments. God's godliness toward man is his favor, his goodness, his favor. You see the goodness and severity of God, it says goodness toward you and severity toward the one who has fallen away. His favor and his grace, that is again a response to the favor and grace of a man. His mercifulness, his thanksgiving, his good work. As a matter of fact, one of the words of grace is thanksgiving and when it says we've received grace for grace, that's and so uh, as it says in the original a uh, grace for grace so you give thanksgiving for thanksgiving we demonstrate our grace our thanksgiving to God because he has redeemed us and then he establishes his redemption and shows us his thanksgiving in the original, again, grace for the grace that you give. His is, this is his good work and his good acts toward man and his kindness in the absolute sense of the word. The Old as well as the New Testament identify the virtue of the love of God and the discipline of godliness. Aside from these characteristics called to identify the character of godliness, there is also a counterfeit form of godliness that exists as well, that conflicts with, the, conflicts with and resists the true form of godliness. Having a form of godliness but denying its power and from such people turn away. 2 Timothy 3.5 and so you may say this person appears holy and as if does everything right but this is just the look but denies its power if we don't break our relationship with people that have the look of godliness and will not distance ourselves from them then they will corrupt our godliness that is contained in our good habits which is why we together with them will inherit the prepared for them destruction 
Relevant to this fact, we have been looking at one of the signs contained in question 4. This is to be our, or our ability to be the cloud of God filled with his moisture and scatter his light that is turned by his guidance for correction for his land and for mercy. Also with moisture he saturates the thick clouds, he scatters his bright clouds, and they swirl about being turned by his guidance, that they may do whatever he commands them on the face of the whole earth. He causes it to come whether for correction or for his land or for mercy. As we read in the beginning, as God pours out his rains upon the righteous and unrighteous, and it's written here how we're supposed to pour them. He causes to come whether for correction or for his land or for mercy. Listen to this, O Job, stand still and consider the wondrous works of God. Do you know when God dispatches them and causes the light of his cloud to shine? Do you know how the clouds are balanced, those wondrous works of him who is perfect in knowledge? Job 37, 11 through 16. Dispatching his clouds for correction or for his land or for mercy, according to his will, means to be a carrier of the favor and punishment of the one that is perfect in, in knowledge. This is one of the fundamental elements by which we need to examine ourselves as to whether we are collaborating our favor with the favor of God. Therefore, consider the goodness and severity of God on those who felt severity, but toward you goodness, if you continue in his goodness, otherwise you also will be cut off. Romans 11, 22. Demonstrating God's goodness toward one and severity toward the other, we become carriers of his justice within his holiness. The phrase, do you know, when God dispatches them and causes the light of his clouds to shine, indicates the fact that not all clouds are able to be clouds that God dispatches and causes the light of it to shine, but only those clouds which provide God a basis so that they can they can contain his moisture in themselves. This is confirmed by another place of scripture. He binds up the water of his thick clouds, yet the clouds are not broken under it. He covers the face of his throne and spreads his cloud over it. Job 26, 8, 9. The throne of God is in a cloud, in the clouds of the Most High. Considering that we are his clouds, then this throne is within us. And to differentiate the clouds of the Most High in the form of the saints that fear God from profane to his nature clouds in the form of pseudo-saints that do not have in themselves the fear of the Lord, it is necessary for us to know that our ability to provide God the basis to fill us with his moisture and our readiness to scatter his light and direct it according to his guidance is our function. By fulfilling this function, we demonstrate our favor to God. The function to fill us with moisture so that we can be led by the Holy Spirit and be turned by His guidance is God's favor, which is His response to our, to Him favor, demonstrated in our readiness to be filled with this moisture, which indicates our hunger and thirst to listen to the preached word of truth. Relevant to this, it was necessary first to study a series of questions. First, what virtues do the scriptures give the cloud of God? Second, what purpose does the cloud of God fulfill? Third, what conditions do we need to fulfill so that God establish us as his clouds? And fourth, by what signs do we need to determine that we are truly the clouds of the Most High? First, to be perfect as our Heavenly Father is perfect, it is necessary to scatter your light from your cloud upon the just and the unjust and pour out the receive from God moisture in the form of rain upon the righteous and the unrighteous. Second, we are called to release the moisture we have from the Heavenly Father in the form of rain and scatter his light according to his will and not according to our whims or our conclusions. In the New Testament, the meaning consisting in the purpose of being a cloud of God is locanically presented in the following words. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God, Romans 8.14, which means that if we are not in accordance to the requirements of a cloud of God, capable of being filled with his moisture and scattering his light for the purpose of correcting one and demonstrating mercy upon another, then our sonhood needs to be seriously questioned. When it talks about clouds lacking moisture who are tossed to and from by all kinds of deceptive teachings that are profane to God, we have been studying the category of people located within the church 
church of saints that are, do not have the Spirit of the Lord and resist the Spirit of the Lord. We've been looking at the cloud of the Most High as the category of saints that are led by the Holy Spirit by the means of their new person, created in accordance to God in Christ Jesus in righteousness and holy truth. And this means that the clouds of the Most High can only be those saints that have grown into full measure of growth in Christ and are in accordance to the demands of perfection that is inherent to God. Further, we have noted that the clouds of the Most High that are within God's possession is a symbol of His great mystery and is called to fulfill a vital role in the work of adopting and redeeming our body from the law of sin and death. Therefore, the cloud of the Most High in Scripture is a symbol of the glory of God, the place where God abides, the clothes into which God dresses, and the midst from which the Lord speaks. In the previous services, we in a specific format already looked at four conditions of the third question that, when fulfilled, gives us the right to be to the power to be in accordance to the clouds of God. Therefore, we will immediately turn to study the fifth condition. Fifth, to be in accordance to the requirements of a cloud of God is the necessity to have the fear of the Lord and to hope upon the mercy of the Lord, who covers the heavens from clouds, who covers the heavens with clouds, who prepares rain for the earth, who makes grass to grow on the mountains. He gives to the beast its food and to the young raven that cry. He does not delight in the strength of the horse. He takes no pleasure in the legs of a man. The Lord takes pleasure in those who fear him and those who hope in his mercy. Psalm 147, 8 through 11. According to this place of scripture, we conclude that the first part of the given allegory contains the response of God as his favor to the favor of man to God, which we see demonstrated by the heart of this man abiding in the fear of the Lord and his heart hoping upon his mercy. Therefore God covers the heavens with clouds, he prepares the rain for the earth and makes the grass grow on the mountains. He gives the beasts food and to the young raven who cry out to him only within the heart of that co category of saints and that category of their descendants in whose heart the fear of the Lord abides, giving them the basis to hope upon the mercy of God. The symbol of the heavens in man abiding in the fear of the Lord is that part of his spirit that God covers with his clouds that is capable of being filled with his moisture and be turned by his guidance in order to scatter his light and pour his rains for mercy and for correction. The symbol of the earth in man is that aspect of his spirit that receives the rain that is being poured down from the clouds of God, which provide God the necessary basis to grow grass upon our mountains in order to give food to our beasts and the young youngsters of our raven. Our beasts, uh, this means the pure animals or clean animals or the unclean but that are able to be used uh, either to uh, be as transportation or to carry uh, goods upon them or as a, again, as a means of transportation. Practically, these are our emotions, our beasts. We need to give them food. How did David do this? He told them, why are you in doubt, O soul? He would speak to it, trust upon the Lord, for I will praise him. We need to tell our feelings directly as we sing, soon the day, the dawn, the dawn of a new day will come. We are approaching that glorious date of the fulfillment of God's promises. Soon you will not be in those circumstances that you are in today. Rejoice together with me because you will be clothed and you will experience something unimaginable. That's why you don't need to sorrow when that's what you say. When a person that there's been a verdict of uh, and a person is condemned for the rest of his life and suddenly they tell him while he's in the prison cell that amnesty has been 
given to you from the governor or the president when a person is uh, told these things there still needs to be a process uh, that that needs to take place documents need to be signed imagine what happens with this person in the cell although he's in the cell he is forever convicted he begins to behave as a person that is free Israel became free from the slavery of Egypt to being in Egypt. If they would not have become free being in Egypt, God would not have been able to lead them out of Egypt. It's important to understand that. Grows, God grows uh, grass upon our mountains. We know that what mountains are. In Scripture, mountains are God's symbol of promises. There are the mountains of God mountains of, and mountains of, of man. And the mountains of man always look with jealousy upon the mountains of God because the mountains of man are self uh, personal opinions. But God's mountains are hope upon God, hope upon the promises of God. And God upon these mountains grows grass. God's promises so that our uh, beasts can feed and the youngsters of our raven uh, to feed. And the raven is the bird that is a symbol of the holiness of God. It's not clean for Israel, but it's not clean for Israel because it is God's holiness. God did not create unclean animals as it, as it is, but we read in the first chapter of 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 Genesis that and God saw that it was good God created everything good and God did not have unclean birds but God separated these animals and said these animals are unclean for you why because man fell he was not in accordance to God's nature but as soon as a person becomes in accordance to God's nature God says now you can eat my holiness and so a raven fed Elijah an unclean bird and his mantle that he was in was of an unclean animal which is also symbol of the holiness of God a camel a camel is a carrier of the Holy Spirit and the gifts of the Holy Spirit symbol of Eleazar Eleazar came upon these camels into Mesopotamia as you know to be able to find a bride to choose from the saved the bride for his master and that means not all will be saved because if all then Laban and Bethuel and the rest would have led out from Mesopotamia into Cain into the other land of Canaan but only Rebecca was taken for her sake did he come there and so we see what these youngsters of the ravens are these are the descendants these are the fruit if we are the holiness of the Lord we need to bear fruits and this fruit needs to be first as uh, in, uh, needs to be demonstrated in honoring God with our tithes and our offerings and when we do this we bear fruit we in this way testify that we are the descendants of this raven and so when we begin to tell our beasts that is our feelings who we are in Jesus Christ and what God has prepared for us then God has the proper basis to accomplish the salvation believe in the Lord Jesus so they said believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved you and your household Acts 16 31 and so when our faith is obedient to God's faith to possess within your essence the virtue of a raven means the holiness of the Lord and pay the price in order to establish yourself as the holiness of the Lord specifically the biting of the human heart in the fear of the Lord provides God the necessary basis to cover the heavens of his spirit with clouds filled with the moisture of his revelations which is the faith of God within his heart which a person pours as rains upon the soil of his heart by confessing the faith of his heart saying to himself communicate with yourself more and out loud when you come home begin to tell yourself who you are in Jesus Christ what God has done for you in Jesus Christ and who you are 
for him in Jesus Christ. Sixth, to be in accordance to the requirements of a cloud of God, it is necessary to be a lightning in the hands of your heavenly Father. Behold, God is great, and we do not know him, nor can the number of his years be discovered, for he draws up drops of water, which distills us rain from the midst. With the clouds drop down and pour abundantly on man, indeed, can anyone understand the spreading of clouds, the thunder from his canopy? Look, he scatters his light upon it and covers the depths of the sea. For by these he judges the people, he gives food in abundance. He covers his hands with lightning and commands it to strike. His, th his thunder declares it, the cattle also concerning the rising storm. Job 36, 26 through 33. Cattle, again, uh, our feelings when God begins to do something within us. The phrase, for he draws up drops of water in this place of scripture. In Hebrew, the acting verb draws means to gather to yourself or to gather up for your use. At the same time, the word drops that God draws up for his use in Hebrew means the descendants of God and the second meaning of drops is stacte, as an aromatic paste, which indicates the fact that the drops of water carry the program of the life of God and are always the fragrance of Christ, ready and able to spread with itself life for one and death for the other. The phrase, can anyone understand the spreading of clouds, the thunder from his canopy is presented in the format of a question to Job indicates and indicates the fact that the spreading of his clouds is identified as the boundaries of the thunder of his canopy. The word thunder in Hebrew means noise that comes from many waterfalls, victorious shout of praise that speaks of the great works of God about the redemption of his nation from the power of sin and death. But you are holy, enthroned in the praises of Israel. Our fathers trusted in you. They trusted, and you delivered them. They cried to you, and were delivered. They trusted in you, and were not ashamed. Psalm 22, 3-5. The phrase, look, he scatters his light upon it, upon his cloud, and covers the depths of the sea, indicates the fact that God covers his canopy, with the light of his wisdom, or places his cloud in the form of his canopy in his godly entrails. Further, over the cloud of the Most High, which is his canopy, he scatters his light and covers the depth of the sea. The word depth in the given place of scripture in Hebrew has yet another meaning. This is the seed and root, which indicates Christ as the patriarch of the faith of God. The word sea in this place of scripture in Hebrew refers to the west or western side, which indicates the end of the age or the great harvest. At the same time, the verb cover, when it comes to the depth of the sea in Hebrew, means to hide from other eyes, to keep hidden in the unapproachable light, to clothe with his mystery, to keep in his mystery, to wrap with himself, to coat with his light, to close on all sides, to cover the body of his son with a veil. Therefore, the phrase, indeed, can anyone understand the spreading of clouds, the thunder from his canopy, means that to a specific time or until a specific time, the Lord conceals the chosen by him remnant in Christ Jesus. From there means that it's from that cloud, which is his canopy in the form of a specific church of saints who are in accordance to the requirements of his chosen remnant, God by the rod of the mouth of his sent ones fulfills his judgment over the nations who have not obeyed the truth of the preached word and amply gives food to his nation who have obeyed his voice or his truth. The phrase, he covers his hands with lightning and commands it to strike, means that the symbol of his hands is his cloud from which the strikes which he strikes his powerful lightning therefore to be the clouds of the most high which are his canopy in which he abides and which he conceals in the entrails of his unapproachable light it is necessary not to peddle with the word of god in order to benefit the whim the whims of your flesh
For we are to God the fragrance of Christ among those who are being saved and among those who are perishing. To one we are the aroma of death leading to death, and to the other the aroma of life leading to life, and who is sufficient to, for these things. For we are not as so many peddling the word of God, but as of sincerity, but as from God we speak in the sight of God in Christ. Second Corinthians. 15 through 17, the phrase, this thunder declares it, the cattle also concerning the rising storm, this is the emotional aspect of our soul for which our new person carries responsibility. The thunder that comes from lightning is the victorious shout of praise in the mouth of the chosen by God remnant, praising God, who speak of his great works, consisting in adopting and redeeming the body of his nation from the power of sin and death. And that's why our emotions feel this. Our body and the emotional part of our soul feel what is happening and receive healing from deadly wounds inflicted by reigning sin, that is, the old person. Seventh, to be in accordance to the requirements of a cloud of God, it is necessary to possess a state of readiness and power to abide within Christ as well as allow Christ to abide in us so you with your life can present the coming Christ. Behold, he is coming with clouds, and every eye will see him, even they who pierced him, and all the tribes of the earth will mourn because of him, even so, amen. Revelations 1.7 The phrase, behold, he is coming with clouds, means he is coming with those whom he knows and who know him. The scripture call his ca this category the chosen remnant from the multitude of the called. So that God could abide within us, God needed to know us before the creation of the world. Then the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Behold, this is Jeremiah 1, 4, 5, Behold, I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I sanctified you, I ordained you a prophet to the nations. The ability of God to know us and separate us from the world by the way of sanctification so that we could be his possession is directly linked to the nature to the natural ability of God to foreknow us in Christ Jesus before the creation of the world. Just as he has chosen us in him before the foundation of the world that we should be holy and without blame before him in love, having predestined us to, adopt, to adoption as sons by Jesus Christ to himself according to the good pleasure of his will to the praise of the glory of his grace by which he made us ac acceptable in the beloved. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sin according to the riches of his grace. Ephesians 1, 4 through 7. Nevertheless, the solid foundation of God stands having the seal. The Lord knows those who are his. And let everyone who names the name of Christ depart from iniquity. 2 Timothy 2.19 For us to abide in God, it is necessary for us to know God similar to how he has known us. But when that which is perfect has come, then that which is in part will be done away. When I was a child, I spoke as a child, I understood as a child, I thought as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then I shall know, just as I also am known. 1 Corinthians 10, 13, 10 through 12. According to the norms of Scripture, God's favor toward us is presented in two steps or two levels. The first level, referring to the favor of God toward us, is demonstrated when God gets to know us, which is why we or why He can then know us by our names as those who have been risen from the dead. The second level, referring to the favor of God toward us, is demonstrated when God allows us to know Him. Considering this, the second level, as is God's favor toward us, is a confirmation of the first level. Then Moses said to the Lord, You have said, I know you by name, and you have also found grace in my sight. 
This is the first level. Now therefore I pray if I have found grace in your sight, show me now your way that I may know you and that I may find grace in your sight and consider that this nation is your people. Exodus 33, 12-13. You see that Moses he says when God says you you know me by name that means you have you knew me before the creation of this world and I've found favor in your sight before the creation of the world and now allow me to know you open your way to me I can't know you if you will not open your way to me so that I may find grace in your sight if we do not get to know God similar to how he got to know us by the revelation of his way which consists in an ultimate goal contained in his redemption that is adopting and redeeming our body from the power of sin and death then we will lose the favor that God has for us not evangelism but the adopting and redeeming our body from the power of sin and death. That is the ultimate goal. But us getting to know him. Now by this we know that we know him if we keep his commandments. He who says I know him and does not keep his commandments is a liar and the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps his word truly the love of God is perfected in him. By this we know that we are in him. 1 John 2, 3-5 and to keep his commandments is consider yourself dead to sin living for God calling the not existent as existent this is difficult for man he's not able to feel it he's not able to sense it see it smell it physically but he needs to base it from the information that he received from the fourth realm hearing the word of God our sanctification is linked to the favor of God that he has for us and it also contains two levels the first level of sanctification happens before the creation of the world when God due to his ability to foreknow gets to know us and separates us as his personal belonging by the way of sanctification the second level of sanctification is called to happen when we leave spiritual childhood and receive the ability to get to know God similar to how he got to know us before the creation of the world to put away childish things means to be sanctified or to be separate or separate yourself as the holiness of the Lord and such a sanctification upon practice means to reject and forget your nation the house of your father and the corrupt desires of your soul in the death of the Lord Jesus in order to achieve his resurrection if the second levels of sanctification linked to the favor of God that he has for us will not come to pass or will not happen in accordance to the strict requirements to separate yourself by the cross of the Lord Jesus from your nation from the house of your father and from your corrupt desires then we will lose the first level of sanctification and our house will be left desolate or empty which upon practice means that we in the role of a cloud will not be able to be filled with moisture of the victorious life of God Furthermore, we will remain than spiritual infants who in the flesh, in the form of clouds that have no water or moisture, stumble and are attracted by all winds of teaching, by the trickery of man, by the sneaky and crafty deception, which will not allow the stronger one by the way of sanctification to enter our, ho our house and destroy the stronghold of death within our bodies. When a strong man fully armed guards his own place or his own palace, his goods are in place or in peace. When a strong man fully armed guards his own palace, his goods are in peace. But when a stronger than he comes upon him and overcomes him, he takes from him all his armor in which he trusted and divides his spoils. The stronger is Jesus in the form of our new person in the surface of justification he who is not with me is against me and he who does not gather with me scatters Jesus says when an unclean spirit goes out of a man he goes through dry places seeking rest and finding none he says I will return to my house from which I came and when he comes he finds it swept and put in order then he goes and takes with him seven other spirits more wicked than himself and they enter and dwell there and the last state of that man is worse than the first Luke 11 21 through 26 
because they sanctified themselves in order to evangelize to the world instead of uh, have your body be adopted and redeemed and destroy the stronghold of death in the body and erect the stronghold of life in the body. Why are we being sanctified? Why are, what goal or purpose do we have? As soon as you put the, uh, an unfaithful purpose or goal, your correct sanctification, although you may have correctly sanctified yourself as your goal was wrong or incorrect, your house will be left desolate and seven more more evil than the first that was there will, uh, will come and dwell there. And then you'll see the synagogues of Satan, what happens, uh, what happens in these churches. So if we will continue with Christ in his trials and will gather with him destroying the stronghold of the old man within our body then such a position will give us power to the right to present the coming Christ we being in the role of his clouds again this position will give us the right and ability to represent the coming Christ our time is up for today right now we will bend our knees and pray and those we will pray and tho- and may the Lord bless us in this prayer. I call those who, all those saints who in some way are bound by sin or terrible obstacles or situations that you are in and you don't know what to do or you're bound by illness and the diagnosis is deadly we sometimes pl- put this diagnosis for ourselves because we know symptoms remember symptoms can be deceptive don't believe symptoms believe who you are in Jesus Christ and who he is, what what who you are in Jesus Christ who he is for you come to his altar repent confess your sins Restore your relationship with God. Begin to tell your soul not what the doctor said and what you feel, but what the Holy Scriptures say about you, and the peace of God will be with you. Amen. I'm going to be praying your prayer, and I ask you to deeply believe in what God says about you in Scripture, what you hear in the preached Word, and not what you feel or what other people may be saying. God is for you. He's not against you. The sacrifice has been paid. He looks at you, if you're obedient to his word, consider yourself dead to sin, living for God, and call the not existent as existent. He sees you perfect in Jesus Christ, and he's ready to fulfill for you all his promises that you've received into your heart. Close your eyes. This is your secret room. This is also your hands lifted to God as a symbol of what God wants to give you pray together with me Heavenly Father in the name of Jesus Christ I come to you with my shame with my fear with my sin with my pain with my suffering for they have clothe me as a garment I hate illness that are a curse at the time when you've been blessing me I receive your blessing in my healing and right now before heaven and hell I want to proclaim that in accordance to your words I am washed I am cleansed I am healed 
I am restored, I am justified, and I am saved. Your sins are forgiven and your trespasses in the name of Jesus Christ. May the Lord bless you. May he look upon you with his great face and show you mercy and give you peace. May thousands and ten thousands attempt to come near you, but they will not touch you. May, with noise, the stronghold of death be thrusted out of your body, and may the stronghold of life be erected. May all this be on you and upon your children and be fulfilled upon you, and the nation shall say, Amen. Let us proclaim our unchanging manifestation. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy to God our Savior who alone is wise be glory and majesty, dominion and power both now and forever. Amen.